went down into the baggage carousel area and fair dinkum, there wasn't a square metre of, of floor space where you could you could just kind of stand because there were so many people waiting. And, you know, it's probably still that backlog of them not having enough customs quarantine officers to get through people. But it was just heaving with people. And, and I remember turning to my wife and saying, you know what, maybe maybe next time we should fly, fly through Brisbane. Hi, I'm Dirk Mulder, founder of The Quiet News. I'm coming to you from Darug Country in Western Sydney. And g'day, I'm Rob Malicki. I'm the CEO of The Global Society, coming to you from Garrigal Land, also in Sydney. Dirk, great to see you in 2024. In 2024, welcome back. I sounds, from what I gather, I think you've had quite the adventurous uh, Christmas break, mate. What have you been up to? Yeah, my wife's French, so had the great fortune of flying back to the homeland for Christmas and New Year. And it was a really nice one this time. Yeah, we really nice one this time, Dirk. You know, often when you go travelling, you end up getting out and about quite a lot, but this one was quite the opposite for us. Discovered a couple of new card games, and we, we literally just had a whole ton of family time around the table, playing cards, chatting it out. Yeah, it was just like really good downtime. That's brilliant, mate. Great to hear. Great to hear. And and you've come back and it's 40 degrees in Sydney now. Yeah, that's right. We're back and we're cooking. And that's kind of funny, isn't it? Because I, I kind of feel like 2024 is going to be a cooking kind of year. I really feel like there's so much stuff that's lining up right now. I reckon you're right. So let's get right into it. Uh, give that just before Christmas we had noises from government. We had some initial announcements about where things were heading. And, you know, maybe just start thinking about what 2024 is going to hold. But first, what's in the news, mate? What are some of the big stories that are sort of tickling the industry as we know it? Yeah. So, I mean, look, it depends on, I guess, how we want to look at it. But if we if we look at it from a global context, I think the biggest lead stories at the moment are coming out of Canada. Their Minister for, for Immigration announced this week that they're actually going to cap international students. And it's a really interesting, I guess, approach because if you think about how caps work, and and certainly here in Australia, we look at, I guess, a, a cap point of view of of every Krikos registered institution has a cap put on it by the amount of people that they can enrol and the amount of people that, that can study at their institution. So by and large, we have an informal cap that is different to something that might be, say, an immigration visa related cap. So you know, in Canada. It's slightly different, right? Because the provinces look after education and international education, but the federal government looks after immigration. So the feds have come in over the top and said they're actually going to cap the amount of study permits in 2024 to 360,000. Now, according to the the release or the announcement from the federal government, that's a a decrease of about 35% from this year. So it's quite alarming. And if we've been keeping up to date with what's going on with Canada, it does seem like there's a lot of work to do. And and some of the nomenclature that they're using is around bad actors, which, you know, is, is quite present with here in Australia as well, albeit Australia, the Australian government actually looking at that in a slightly different way. So big news out of Canada this week, and it's going to be, it'll be interesting to see how that, this this one pans out over the next week or two, particularly in the context as, as you say, parliamentarians here in Australia are are coming back. And some of those changes that we saw announced before Christmas will be hitting the parliament floor, I suggest, in the next, in the next few weeks, if not months. So definitely one to keep out for. And why else? I mean, I hear that when you say bad actors, like of of course, that that, that's a challenge, but there are other ways to deal with that, and I think we've seen some of the moves the Australian government has started to make last year to sort of shut down loopholes and close down those bad actors in the industry, but none of those have involved, you know, caps. So do you feel like there's something else at play here that's not being said? Yeah, look, there is. I mean, I think a couple of similarities and a couple of differences. The similarities are the housing crises of both countries are really pressing a thought about how many international students are actually coming in. When we talk about bad actors, that's the difference. So here in Australia, we have a chronic cost registration scenario. We have what we call COEs. So the immigration office can see who a genuine student is. In Canada, that's a little bit different. So they don't have COEs or they don't have an immigration registration system where a student presents themselves with a COE. The immigration officer can look into the system and see that a registered provider has allocated that COE and then they provide the visa on that. At the moment, they've got essentially a letter, which again could be fraudulent. Visa office actually stamps that based on that letter 
And then there's an audit process that goes on post that point. Now, they've acknowledged that this is a bad way of doing things. So I think what we'll see over the next 12 months is a fast tracking of a new system. But what that means uh, in broader terms and where I think the stresses are in, in Canada at the moment is they have um, a much larger public-private delivery system. So a university might essentially allow their coursework to be taught by a private provider. And it's those private providers, from what I'm seeing in in the press coming out of Canada, that are over-enrolling and they're over-enrolling from certain countries. And the major one, obviously, is India. So it's in that space where I think we're going to see a lot of work from Canada over the next 12 months. And in the meantime, I think the federal government has enough pressure on it to say, hey, we need to dampen down essentially the demand in this space to make sure that it's manageable. Yeah, I guess closer to home, the Australian government last year, just before Christmas, made an announcement that they wanted to have a look at migration and reduce the overall migration numbers. And I I think that, you know, there's been a bit of discourse in the newspapers, in the big nationals around international student numbers. I think international educators probably went into Christmas here feeling a little bit nervous, but maybe we're coming into 2024 with things like this on the agenda you know, caps and, and the like on the agenda. How do you see that that playing out? No, you're absolutely right. And one of the things prior to the draft of the international education strategy being released was a shock around caps. And if you remember, uh, James Campbell from one of the presses, uh, from one of the, the newspapers in Sydney, wrote a story about caps being thought about by the Australian government. It was released without caps, and I don't think caps was ever on the actual table, but certainly there is an, an overall view that the total number of, mig- of migrants coming to Australia over the next few years does need to be dampened. And I think from memory, the story that, that we certainly ran was, if you look at those numbers, I think there's about 150,000 currently on the COVID bridging visa. And I believe the in last year, I believe it was in May, they stopped new entrance to that COVID visa. And Reapplications could can, could continue up until I believe it's February this year. So we'll we'll, so, we'll soon see those tie off, and then a whole bunch of people roll off this COVID COVID event visa essentially. So that's one hundred and fifty thousand people that almost immediately or as they roll off that visa will come out of the migration system. So there's a fair whack right there. When you then start thinking about course hopping, and I suspect, and again, I've got no information, but I suspect that the genuine student test will look at those students who are already onshore going into different courses and saying, well, how does this relate to being a genuine student? There's probably going to be some that slip out of that. So when you look at the overall numbers, getting to that 200, 250,000 decline I don't think is going to be as big a deal as what a lot of people think. In saying that, there's been a lot of feedback in December and now that visa processing has slowed and in some places like Pakistan has almost dried up completely. So there's definitely been a shift over the last sort of six weeks to to drop drop off some of those numbers and then there'll be an anticipation, I think, in, in Q1 and Q2 of next year that we'll see some of those numbers moving out of the migration system. Do you have a feeling that if this does go ahead in Canada, they do impose a cap, that that will drive more demand to Australia? We've seen some of those visa acceptance rate or visa approval rates, I should say, for for countries like India are far lower than from other countries, for example, from China. I saw that in in the Koala News last year. But surely if Canada, that door is being closed somewhat, do we expect to see some of that coming back Australia's way? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the way to look at that is if you've got global flows, right? So, and when a country cuts back by, you know, however many, many it is, 35%, then there's going to be a natural shift in demand to other destinations. Australia could expect, I would imagine, could expect in, uh, an increase in demand because of that. But I think so could the UK. And if people are set on Canada, I think the big winner will be the US, quite frankly. I mean, if you're looking at North America, tier two kind of colleges, you know, not the Ivies, maybe not even the next level, but the next level down, they'll probably end up being the winners out of this because I think the US is still is still very much open to, to increasing their international education population. If you think about the college system and what's going on in the US at the moment, demand domestically is going down because the fees are so high. Going out of state now is is ridiculous. And even in-state colleges are having to raise their fees to, to prop up state budgets. So international education in the US, I think from a private perspective or from a private fee perspective, will increase in demand and, and that may well soak a lot of that. A bit closer to home. So we've had some movement from a couple of universities, some, some announcements early in the new year from, from Deakin and also from Griffith University. You want to take us through some of those announcements? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we, if you remember, there was a, a ministerial visit to India and Deakin in Wollongong where that were at the front of that. They're going to be the first two institutions to set up a foreign campus in India. It's wonderful to see. Deakin's actually inaugurated their campus in, over the break. So they're off to the races, essentially. They're live and they're going to start teaching in September, I believe. From a, 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 a truly global perspective, isn't it wonderful to see Australia being a first mover under the new laws in India? And I think it's wonderful and it's going to do wonders for Australian-Indian relations more generally. And congratulations to Deakin and the team for doing that and, and also for Wollongong being you know, not far behind them. And I, I kind of almost feel a little bit sorry for Wollongong in the fact that they've been in Deakin's shadow pretty much this entire run, but they're right there as well. So it's it's wonderful for Australia for Australia to to have that. And like I said, it's going to be great for, for Australian and India relations. Absolutely. And some announcements announcement from Griffith as well up on the Gold Coast. Yeah, absolutely. So Griffith is has announced that they're actually putting a whole bunch more beds on their Gold Coast campus. I think 459 uh, is what it is. That That's in conjunction with Campus Living Villages. And the reason this one springs out for me is that the accommodation debate has been ongoing now for probably six to 12, if not 18 months. And this is probably one of the first new builds that I've seen announced. So Again, congratulations to Griffith, congratulations to CLV, putting student beds on campus and investing into the future. Because I think, you know, most people can see that as over the next few years, demand isn't going to drop off that much, particularly for universities. Housing, the housing crisis doesn't look like being solved anytime soon. So creating beds close to campuses is really important. And I think that takes their their total quantum up to about a thousand beds on campus on the Gold Coast campus. So so it's wonderful. And they're never going to lose on that investment. That's that's the reality, is that there should always be demand for for those facilities. So that's really smart. I, I love what Griffith has done with that Gold Coast campus. Uh, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty it's, impressive, it's isn't it? Old. It's, it's re- yeah, relatively young. I think maybe about 15, 15 years old, 20 years old. It's not that old. But just the whole precinct around, the, I mean, exactly. the campus already is, is thriving, the hospital, yep. I don't know. The, the light rail, they just seem to be getting it right, 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 right everywhere. So, yep, you know, fair play, to, fair play to Griffith for, for maximising their impact in that in that region of Australia. 100%, 100%. A couple of other interesting things here that, that, that I've spied in, in the koala recently. So, announcement from Qantas about additional flights coming into Darwin. What's that about, mate? So, literally, Qantas has announced five weekly flights from Darwin to Singapore. It'll kick off on the 9th of December this year. So, there's still a time to wait, but it's great to see that they're, they're actually thinking this. That'll actually increase in frequency in March 2025 to, to one daily. And over the year, that'll add about 60,000 seats between Darwin and Singapore. So, there's a couple of things around this. So, from my point of view, I, I actually wrote a story back with Campus Morning Mail about Darwin being a gateway into kind of lower Southeast Asia. And when we think about it, that well. yeah, I think when we think about Indonesia, for instance, there's a lot of tier two cities, which is still massive compared to what Australia would think. Having Darwin as a gateway port, as a gateway flight connector, just makes a lot of sense. So this, to me, signals a bit of a first step. At the moment, I, th- I want to say it's Silk Air has a flight out of Singapore into Darwin, but the connectivity just isn't what it would be if you were in e- Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, and even Adelaide or Perth. They just don't get that connection. So this is wonderful news. And who knows from here? I, I know that the Vice Chancellor, Scott Bowman up there, is very keen to see some more direct point-to-point flights out of Darwin. And I, let's hope that happens. I think it'd be amazing to have... I remember reading your article last year and just thinking, yes, that would be so great. You know, Darwin is so much better placed than other, you know, even better than Perth to some extent that now Qantas has flown those direct flights to the UK and soon to Paris as well. I believe this year they're launching direct from Perth to, Perth to Paris. But Darwin, imagine all the places that you can hit directly out of Darwin and then having that as a point to point, what do you call it? Like the, the hub of the spoke, hub of the wheel <laughs> and then having other in. Yeah, well, and mate, it, it just fits so well into, I guess, broader government policy around having a North Australia strategy. So if, you, if you're thinking around that, having a major a major connection point in the North of Australia just makes so much sense. And again, it doesn't necessarily need to be, it, it can be a hub into Lower Southeast Asia. You know, imagine being able to go to Cambodia or somewhere else by being able to 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 transit in Darwin rather than having to go all the way to Singapore. It just, it, to me, it makes a lot of sense. It'll be interesting to see where it goes. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me too. This time flying back into Australia, flying into Sydney Airport from from Singapore, and I have never seen it such a dog's breakfast. We, I mean, we got to immigration and the queues were, were enormous and we thought, God, we're going to be here for an hour. In fact, immigration did a fantastic job. Everybody just, you know, they 
flew through that line. We went down into the baggage carousel area and fed in them. There wasn't a square meter <laughs> of, of floor space where you could you could just kind of stand because there were so many people waiting. Yeah. And, you know, it's probably still that backlog of them not having enough customs quarantine officers to get through people. But it was just yep. heaving with people. And, and I remember turning to my wife and saying, you know what, maybe maybe next time we should fly fly through Brisbane. Uh, yeah. It's an extra domestic flight, but fly up to Brisbane and then do your international flight out of there because it was just such a terrible experience. I really feel the problem we've had here in Sydney is having a, a monopoly on the airports. They haven't invested enough in the infrastructure and it just shows. No, absolutely. Hey, two more years, right? Nancy Bird in Western Sydney will be open and it'll be it'll be a brand spanking new airport. Yeah, and hopefully that brings in that competition we need just because yeah. it's Sydney airport's expensive, it's overcrowded. You know, I, I, the user experience is just not what it should be for a massive international airport. So every time I see something like this thing around Darwin, I thought, yeah, that's that's an interesting opportunity to not only level up part of regional Australia, giving opportunities up there, but as a traveller, sure. Yeah, if I can fly up to, to Darwin and connect in Darwin and then fly direct from there to Europe or elsewhere into Asia, mm. that, that would make a lot of sense. Yep. A lot of sense I, to me. So. I agree. agree. Tick many, many boxes. Indeed. What else ahead into into twenty twenty four? So I've seen some of the export figures are out, the twenty twenty two twenty three export figures, and international education remains one of our top exports. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, it does. I guess we've been really fortunate that Alan Olson has joined the Koala as a contributor. Alan obviously did a lot of the benchmarking for the AUIDF in the early days and has a stellar reputation in, in this space. So once a year, he he digs out all the export figures and, and you're absolutely right. So we're the fourth largest export in the 2022-2023 financial year behind coal, iron ore and natural gas. I think we're, we're going to get back to number three shortly, I reckon, depending on, on how those other natural commodities go. And it's great to see the service industry like international education, you know, competing with some of our major exports. It's it's really good to see. I've always loved how Alan Olson describes Australia's industry, or international education as the only thing that defines Australia as being more than a hole in the ground with a view. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and for those who, who, who don't know him, I mean, one of Australia's most respected consultants and mm. uh, international education thinkers going back decades, I mean, we're talking all the way yep. back to the beginning of, of international ed pretty much, or late 1990s um, absolutely. at least. So, mate, a coup for the koala to have someone of that calibre now Absolutely. contributing. Good on you. And um, Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Just another great reason, if you're listening to this podcast, if you want your dose of international education news, everything that's going on in the industry, thekoalanews.com, you've got to be on that mailing list. It's the only place where you get Australia-specific news straight to your inbox, all the stuff you need to know, so make sure you jump on and subscribe. That aside, interesting year ahead. Appi is hitting Australia which is exciting over in Perth. It is. API returns. It's the first time in, oh, I've forgotten off the top of my head, but it's the first time in a long time it's been in, in Australia. So it's, it's wonderful to welcome it back. And you're right, in Perth on the 4th of H, 8th, the 4th to the 8th of March. Institutions in Perth are gearing up for, for tours and for all sorts of activities. I know Study Perth and the Western Australian Government are now starting to think about before and after experiences. And, and if you hit the website, there's lots of information available. So API 4th to 8th of March in Perth. And lastly, Dirk, thinking about 2024, if you were going to make one prediction about 2024, what would it be? What do you think is in store for us in the industry? I think the major thing for me would be being agile and having some scenario plans in the bottom drawer. I, I just I can't see, particularly Q1, being anything more than responding to what might be going through Parliament. And you've got to remember, there's still a number of inquiries still still to land. So there's a couple of things still to come. There's going to be a whole bunch of stuff moved through Parliament. There's probably going to be some feedbacks. The minister's going to provide an update. So if I was in industry at the moment, I would be having three or four different plans in my bottom drawer that I could pull out depending on on which way the wind blows on some of these things. Beyond that, I think probably Q3 and 4, we'll start seeing that settle and we'll start seeing, or we'll start going back to some sort of, of normality, if I can put it that way. And I mean, it's the new normal, right? What's normal about international education is that it, it, it's always changing, but I don't think we'll see that the big changes that we will coming out of, you know, the end of last year's reviews into this into Q1 being still reviewed and then the changes going into place. Hopefully we'll, we'll get back into a new cycle and a new pattern. Yeah, and no, government's very preoccupied right now with cost of living relief measures. 
I think mm. as we as we record that Australian government is in the process of changing their position on the stage three tax cuts. So I think that's, that's right. going to dominate the political cycle probably for the next for the next three or four weeks at least. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, par- I think parliamentarians were, were recalled today or yesterday back to Canberra to, to, for those discussions. So if the government's definitely taking it seriously. If I'm reading the tea leaves right, that must mean that they're starting to think about elections. Absolutely. And Rob, what about you, mate? How, what does 2024 look like for you? What's your major prediction? My major prediction, I'm really thinking a lot about the impact of AI this year. I think it's last year, it already hit institutions' radars in a big way, particularly from the curriculum point of view, how and and the teaching and learning, how we're going to make sure that students are actually learning what they need to learn and not just plugging this through chat GPT to speed things up. I think that work is well and truly underway. Where I think this really hits institutions and organizations this year is in the marketing side of things. Uh, Interestingly enough, Yesterday, I was uh, recording a podcast episode with James Martin from the Insider Sweet. Guides. Great guy. Really good, sensible, smart producers of awesome quality content. Mm. And what we really were talking about was just how this generative AI stuff, text, image, and the like, is is going to erode trust mm. on the internet mm. because poor quality or medium quality unverified information is just going to be everywhere. Yep. And it's going to look authentic, but without all of those checks and balances that good uh, content sites provide. Yep. And I think what that's going to do is is going to drive even more traffic and trust towards those established information sources. Yep. So whether that's an IDP or a QS, whether that's the institution's own websites, yep. I really feel this year that that generative AI and AI tech in general is going to fundamentally shift the landscape. I think we saw a glimpse of it last year. But like it or not, I, I feel like that wave is is cresting and about to break and it's going yeah. to shift things in a big way. No, I, I, I agree with you. Well, mate, very good to reconnect. You too. Once again, thekoalanews.com for all of your information, weekly news about what's going on in the industry. And if you're learning abroad specialist, the Global Society is your organization. We are learning abroad support specialist here to support you with all of that side of things. But otherwise, we're looking forward to continuing to chat with you out throughout the year. So make sure you hit subscribe, share the podcast with a colleague. We will see you throughout 2024. Great to see you again, Dirk. And you, Rob. Thanks very much. See you next time. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.